Following is a series of 15-minute daily messages of the America's Promise radio broadcast by Pastor Sheldon Emery. Every radio broadcast has an introduction from the station, and then the person that has been introduced is expected to acknowledge the introduction with a thank you. Thank you. In the fourth chapter of Proverbs, I read, starting in verse 5 through 7, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting get understanding. The people and the nations of Christendom today are confused and are being overthrown by the forces of Antichrist because we have not studied to learn the wisdom and understanding which is in the Bible, the Holy Word of God. And that is the reason why we are studying God's creation in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, to get the wisdom and understanding of God's work God's creation as he records it in his word. All right, turn with me to the first and second chapters of Genesis again. And we're going to compare today in a little more detail the difference between Genesis 2 and Genesis 1. In Genesis 2 we read, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. In other words, this is the end of creation, and then the seventh day of rest following the completeness of God's work in the creation in Genesis 1. Then verses 4 and 5 are a summation of the creation. But notice, even in this summation it says, And there was not a man to till the ground. This is the end of verse 5. Now that cannot mean that there were no men, for men and women were created on the sixth day, according to verses 26 through 28 of Genesis 1. So, the emphasis in Genesis 2 and verse 5 must not be on the man, but on the words to till the ground. And I believe that it is highly significant that it is the white man, Adam's descendants, if you please, who are the only really successful husbandmen and agriculturists of the earth. To pre-Adamic man, God had said in verse 29, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. Yes, and pre-Adamic man, the Negro, the Polynesian, the Aborigines of Australia and South Asia, have lived from plants and trees growing wild, and seem to have learned planting and cultivation of herbs, grains, and fruits, and the domestication of animals only after they came in contact with Adamic man during the last 6,000 years. Yes, even after Genesis, where we read there was not a man to till the ground. Then in Genesis 2 comes the forming of Adam. And let's list these events in their order and compare them with the order of creation in the six days recorded in Genesis 1. In verse 7 of Genesis 2, Adam is formed by God. In verse 8, God plants a garden in Eden. In verse 9, in the garden he causes to grow the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. No mention is made of such a tree in the creation in Genesis 1. Verse 11 through verse 14, the garden is identified in a very limited, restricted part of the earth covering some rivers known today. In verse 15, Adam, the man to till the ground, was given the job and the responsibility to dress and keep the Garden of Eden. In other words, Adam was made the husbandman of the Garden of Eden. 
And this must have been a wonderful place, exceeding the rest of the earth, occupied by pre-Adamic man, for even the prophets, prophesying of the kingdom which is to come, promised it to be as Eden. For instance, Isaiah 51, the first three verses. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock when she are hewn, and to the hole of the pit when she are digged. God says, You look back at your origin. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving, and the voice of melody. In the 36th chapter of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel the prophet repeats the new covenant promise of a new heart. Verse 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And then he promises great material earthly blessings in that end of the age. And let's read the last few verses of Ezekiel 36. Verse 33, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen... And remember, there are people other than God's chosen people, the Adamic people. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, built the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock, as the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feast. So shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Yes, this earth, this new Jerusalem, this earth in the kingdom age, shall become such that men shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden. No, Adam was not put in the rest of the earth. Adam, our forefather, was in a limited geographical location called Eden. All right, back to Genesis 2. Adam is now in the Garden of Eden. Then in verses 16 and 17, he is given a commandment to obey with death as punishment for disobedience. Pre-Adamic man had died naturally as the beast. Adamic man was created ever living, and death came only after sin. And that is why Paul writes in Romans 5 and verse 14, Nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Pre-Adamic man was not the figure of him that was to come, but Adam, who is called the Son of God, was. In Genesis 2, verses 18 through 20, after Adam is formed and placed in the garden, we find the creation of beasts and fowls in Eden. Verses 21 through 23, the last creation in Eden, one woman, Eve. And let's just go back, and for just a moment, let us repeat again the order of events in the first creation in Genesis 1. The first day, light day and night. The second day, the water separated. The third day, dry land in the seas, grass, herbs, and trees. The fourth day, lights in the heaven, the great light for day and the lesser light for night. The fifth day, the small moving creatures, fowls, whales, and every living creature. And then finally, on the last day of creation, more of cattle and creeping things, and then man, male and female, and God gave them orders 
to replenish the earth. Adam was given no such order, and in fact, Eve bore her first son after being expelled from the Garden of Eden because of sinning against the command of the Lord. And Pastor Emery must again express his amazement that men who call themselves preachers of the Word of God, ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ, will refuse to acknowledge the simple truth that the creation of Adam and the Garden of Eden is not the same as the creation of pre-Adamic man and woman in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 28. The creation of these people prior to the creation of Adam outside of the garden in the rest of the world answers the question as to where Cain got his wife and who the inhabitants were of the city which was builded by Cain. It answers the strange verses in Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4. And let's read those. We'll cover them in more detail at another time. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Who were the sons of God? Naturally, Adamic men. Who were the daughters of men? the daughters of pre-Adamic man. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children of them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Yes, these people, the Adamic people mixed with the pre-Adamic, and the false preaching about the first two chapters of Genesis and also about the flood is the main effort of propaganda against the descendants of the Adamic race today to get us to mix with the heathen. If you will look at any of the propaganda emanating from pro-communist, liberal, and anti-Christian and anti-American sources, you will see that all of it and every time, everywhere, is designed to do one thing, to get the Adamic race to mix with the heathen. This is Pastor Sheldon Emery, and my time is just about up this week. I have just enough time to tell you to write to me at Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, and ask for the August Packet of Literature. You should read this 100-page book titled, In the Image of God. A Professor Carroll wrote the manuscript for this book 72 years ago. It was recently reprinted in 1967. In the Image of God, going into much detail as to the origin of the races, far beyond what I can do on these short radio broadcasts. Along with that, you'll get the sheet on the peace symbol showing the anti-Christian origin of the upside down and broken cross. My track, Who Are the Israelites? Showing where on the surface of the globe the Israelites would be congregated in this end of the age. Also, another reprint of newspaper articles titled Whites to Adopt Asiatic Children, showing that the liberals and our own government are planning on bringing tens and perhaps hundreds of thousands of Asiatic Mongolian children into America, either for adoption or to be raised in foster homes. If you want my tape cassettes of these two subjects, should we love the wicked or the righteous? And where was the flood of Noah's time? You send an offering of two dollars or more and ask for both the August packet and the cassette tape. You can have the August packet for just writing. You need not send an offer, but brother, sister, we must have your prayers and your tithes to stay on these radio stations. Until next week when we return to the study of the book of Genesis, Lord willing, goodbye, God bless you and Christian America. Thank you. During the last several days we have seen the irreconcilable differences between the creation accounts in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, showing that the forming of Adam and his subsequent history from Genesis 2 and on is an account of the creation of a different race of men than the account of creation of man and woman as we read it in Genesis 1. 
Now let's study just a little further the accounts in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 in relation to another object which gives us the foundation for all of the subsequent history and prophecy of the Bible. As I have told my Christian listeners before, all of the great doctrines of the Bible have their foundation in the book of Genesis and would to God. Christian people and those who profess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would study to know the book of Genesis. This is primarily the tree of life which we read about when we read about Adam. And this, of course, also is an additional very, very important difference because there is no mention of a tree of life in the creation account in Genesis 1. So turn with me in your Bibles again to Genesis 2, and I read after the forming of Adam in verse 9, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God did not command Adam to refrain from eating of the tree of life as we see in verses 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now the story of the temptation by Satan of Eve and the subsequent disobedience by Adam is not related to the tree of life, but to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we read of that in verse 6 of chapter 3. And when the woman saw that the tree, referring to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Because of this act of disobedience, of course, God banished them from the garden, and the reason for the banishment is very, very important to our understanding of our Bible. Verse 22 through verse 24 of Genesis 3. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever, therefore, or because of this, to prevent him eating of the tree of life, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The removal of Adam and Eve from the garden of Eden was not just the simple removal of these people from a favorable abode as punishment for the disobedience, but it was a denial of everlasting life, an everlasting life which was available to both Adam and Eve in the garden from the tree of life which was not forbidden. And from then on, the Bible is the history and the prophecy of God's plan of redemption and restoration of the race of Adam to that place of everlasting life as sons and daughters of God through the atoning power of Jesus' blood and the destruction of death by his resurrection, as we read, of course, in the New Testament and especially in the letter to the Hebrews. Now to show you the relationship of Jesus Christ to the tree of life, let's read just a few verses in John 5 and John 6. And these are words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself about himself. And again, brother, sister, you should have a better understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ after you have an understanding of the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. In John 5, Jesus is speaking to the Jews in Jerusalem. And he says, among other things, in verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, 
when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live, in effect telling them that those who heard the Lord Jesus Christ would be made alive. He continues in talking to them, identifying himself as the Messiah. In verse 39 and 40, he says to these same Jews, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. Jesus not only was saying to the Jews that Jesus was the only way to eternal life, but he told them that they would not come to him. A prophecy, of course, that they would refuse the Lord Jesus Christ and refuse everlasting life. In the sixth chapter of John is Jesus' words about himself being that bread of life which would give everlasting life to those who partook of it. You should read the entire sixth chapter of John. I will read just a few verses. Verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Verse 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 53, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. You can see from just a few verses that I read, and of course from your knowledge of the New Testament, that Jesus Christ is the substitutionary tree of life which was forbidden to Adam and Eve when they were exiled from the Garden of Eden. All right, now turn with me to the last two chapters of God's Word, the final end of this age, the culmination of the history and prophecy of the Bible, from Genesis 2 all the way to Revelation 21 and 22. Revelation 21 is, of course, the story of the new heaven and the new earth called that holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We are told that there is no temple in there because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. But then in Revelation 22 and verse 2 we find these strange words which fit so well with Genesis 2. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And then these beautiful words of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 12 and 13. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Yes, brother, sister, this is Jesus Christ, the Creator, as we have seen from the Bible, and also the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. He is the beginning and the end for his people. And then he says in verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Yes, the entire story of the Bible, from the second chapter of Genesis, from the fall of Adam, if you please, in disobedience, and God's provision that he not partake of the tree of life, is the story, the history, and the prophecy of redemption and restoration of God's chosen Israel people, the descendants of Adam, to partaking of the tree of life in the kingdom. Yes, Jesus Christ and his blood bring about the atoning power for our remission of sins and for the destruction of death by his resurrection. Yea, 
everlasting life through the tree of life, the bread of life, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and my sisters, how can you neglect so great a salvation? This is Pastor Sheldon Emery, and I do hope and pray that this study of the first few chapters of Genesis will help you when you read the rest of God's Word. It makes a sense and a continuity and a reason that perhaps you have never seen in this Bible. And I urge you again, study the book of Genesis. Jesus Christ told the unbelieving Jews that they should search the Scriptures because the Scriptures spoke of him. If you understand the book of Genesis and the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot but see Jesus Christ on every page of your Bible. Yes, Jesus Christ, the God of whom Paul spoke in the second chapter of his letter to the Ephesians, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by whose grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Yes, brother, sister, we shall live an everlasting life in the ages to come through the tree of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do hope and pray that you will read your Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 as the days and weeks and months and years go by. This is Pastor Sheldon Emery again urging you to write for our August packet of literature. You will receive just for the asking the book in the image of God, the sheet on the peace symbols, my track Who Are the Israelites and the article about whites to adopt Asiatic children, a subject which I believe you shall have a greater understanding on when you see it in the light of God's holy word. And for those who want more of a study on the book of Genesis, I would suggest you send an offering of two dollars or more, ask for the August packet of literature and the cassette tape with the two sermons, Should We Love the Wicked or the Righteous? And on side two, where was the flood of Noah's time? Both of these, with their foundation in the book of Genesis, will give you a greater understanding of God's word. Until tomorrow when I return, Lord willing, this is Pastor Emery saying goodbye. God bless you and Christian America.